All right, so our next pre presentation is going to be Mark Gandy from G3 CFO, and we'll feature an interview portion with Quantrix General Manager Brad Hopper. Thank you for being here, Mark. I think I'm going to hand things over to Brad, though, very quickly beforehand. All right, so this is Brad Hopper and the GM of Quantrix, as, as Brendan said. And um, I wanted to, just before I start, give you all a reminder that although this is the last customer presentation for the day, we do have an introductory demonstration after. For those of you who are new to Quantrix, I would say most of our existing customers don't need to stick around for that. But we have a number of folks who have not seen Quantrix before, who have been attracted by the high quality content of the presenters uh, this afternoon and this morning and uh, who, who joined us for that. So um, stick around if you are in that kind of group and you'd like to see uh, a little bit more about how Quantrix works from a sort of basics level. Now then, um, we are pleased and privileged to have Mark Gandy of G3 CFO here with us. Mark calls himself a reformed accountant. He started his career at KPMG and over the years has held a few different controller and CFO positions. Mark is a pioneer in the part-time CFO industry. And being one of those people who commits himself to sharing what he has learned, he started a consulting practice to help other CFOs do this kind of work. Then also, being a lover of books, he started a podcast called The CFO Bookshelf, where he interviews authors and innovators in the financial industry to again help share their knowledge. Um, and in fact, he loves books so much that he decided to write one himself called Becoming a Part-Time CFO, coming soon. Mark, maybe you'll tell us something about that at the end. Um, and some have also called Mark the CEO Whisperer. He coaches CEOs in how to look at the big picture and find ways to grow their business. And we're so glad to have Mark here to whisper to us a little bit. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing that big slide there. That's so Mark, the I ha <laughs> uh, it's great to have you here with us, Mark, howdy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm a little, little nervous. Uh, we probably have the best financial modelers in the world, and I've been watching a few of them. And so uh, I, I hope no one leaves. Hope there's not a mass exodus. I'm sure that I'm sure that won't be the case. Um, now, Mark, um, our attendees must be impressed from the intro that you are a man of many talents, <clears throat> but. Some of them may be wondering what exactly it is that you do for CEOs and maybe how Quantrix involved, is involved in that process. That is an interesting question. The, the, the way I, I don't sell CFO services, I don't sell financial modeling. I will get, I only take on clients that are referred to me and I will just spend maybe five, 10, 15 minutes, just tell me about your business. And you're gonna, one of your questions you're gonna ask, I'm gonna explain how I jump in to support them. But my goal is usually a business owner is stuck. And it's like, why are they stuck? So the goal is to help them to get from unstuck or from stuck to unstuck and to be able to hit some objectives that they've never have had, been able to meet before on their own. So. To answer your question, it's a little bit tricky. It's it's really just helping them to make more money, have more time, and have more meaning in their lives. Now, you and I have talked a little bit a few times offline, and you have expressed your um, love for a, an idea that you might call reverse planning, kind of thinking from the top down rather than um, modeling from the bottom up, or maybe doing a little bit of both of those. Do you want to share a little bit what that means and why it might be important and, and how you use it with your clients? There is a book written in the 1980s. He's from Germany, so the author's not that well known. The name of the book is called The Logic of Failure. And inside that book, he talks about goal setting on the side, and then he talks about reverse planning to get those goals. And I'd never heard that term until I read that little blurb. And I thought, why don't more people think that way? And then there's another great book. You can look it up. I think it's called Outcomes Versus Outputs or Outcomes or Outputs, something like that. Look it up. His name is Josh Seaton. Great, great guy. And so 
he's very into outcome thinking too. So I'm always thinking about, okay, once I know what that CEO wants for the future, let's just reverse engineer. And then we also try to figure out what's what's in the middle, what, what's going to cause some sticking points. Well, that becomes a raw material to get there. So I think it's just more just, it just seems so logical to think what has to be true today to hit that objective, whether it's going to be a year from now, two years, or three years from now. So that that's kind of the, the thought process on reverse planning. I don't use that term with with clients, but it's part it's part of my DNA as we're trying to solve problems. Yeah, you you had mentioned previously something that you called the world's simplest financial model. I think in the prior presentation we had some models that I would say maybe aren't the world's simplest models, but yet have incredible power. But, you know, it strikes me that, you know, models that are complex have a, or that, you know, that work for you have an inherent power to them. But there's also this idea of a, a, a simpler conceptual model that might even have more power in that it's designed to help you think about a problem and, and you know, pull out your your extend your thought process and help you understand what it is that you're dealing with um what what do you mean by the the world's simplest financial model and then we, we will show an example here in a bit in fact brad i'm a little bit nervous to share it because it may not be the world's smallest or simplest for some of the guys who are watching and listening they may think it's the world's dumbest model but you have to keep in mind, and, and by the way, for people around the, the globe, outside of the U.S., a lot of people I'm serving, they go to EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, EOS. Uh, they go to Vistage. Uh, they, they go to, uh, they, they follow uh, Bernhard Hardish, the Scaling Up. So a lot of these people I interact with, they don't have that planning muscle. Rich knows exactly what I'm talking about. Gilbert knows exactly what I'm talking about. Erica, all of us in this room, virtual room, we have this planning muscle. It's, just, it's always turned on, but when you talk to these CEOs, that muscle does not exist. So I start with a very, very simplest model. And for those of y'all who understand throughput reporting, throughput analysis, that's really what it's, it's predicated on. So I built it mainly just to solve a simple problem to help getting to a little bit more complex uh, and structured planning model. Because by the way, I love those other models, but I have to start a little bit simpler. You know, you, you said something there about, um, you know, who's doing the modeling. Uh, what do you think about like an organizational <clears throat> concept there? Uh, you know, should everybody in the organization be a modeler or, um, you know, in a part-time way, or should everybody be an analyst? Do you have a do you have a philosophy about uh, different people's functional roles and how they might work together? I was taught, Brad, a long time ago that when someone says that's a good question, they're faking it. What what they really mean is, give me two days to think about it, and I'll have the perfect uh, answer. I I do I do believe planning, and I'm talking uh, high-level planning. I call it HLP, high-level planning. I think anyone in a, in a shop, you know, take take a, wherever you get your tires uh, rotated or change or oil change, uh, people in the shop need to know how to do basic planning. Now, their planning may only go out for eight hours or four days, five days. Uh, I think everyone should have a planning acumen. Now, will we ever be Erica's or Gilbert's or Rich's? I'm not talking about that, but just the basics to help them to be able to think better and just make better resources. Think about planning. Here's a good definition for planning. Planning is about the application of limited resources with alternative uses. And for those of you who are expert economists, yes, I'm plagiarizing Thomas Sowell. So I, the answer is yes, but you're obviously going to have that planning group that this is all they do 24-7, uh, 365. But I still think everyone throughout the organization should have a planning acumen. What about, hope, that wasn't, um, hope that wasn't rambling. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, so what about um, the idea of 
KPIs. A lot of people talk about kind of um, driver driven modeling or KPIs, and maybe those are opposed to one another, or maybe they're secretly the same thing. Um, I wonder, you know, if you have some ideas about what are the key metrics that someone should focus on, or or at least what are some of the key, you know, business processes from which someone might derive a metric that's right for their business? Well, first of all, this is going to be highly controversial, uh, and it's okay if people disagree uh, with me. I don't even like, and by the way, I have some good friends who are KPI experts, I have some good friends that have written books, and, and I respect uh, their work. In my world, in my little world, I do not use the word KPI. I never do. And why is that? Because it's almost like a religion. You know, there's over 400 organized religions around the world. So it's like, who's right, who's wrong? So when you get into KPIs, it's like, okay, which one, which one? So again, I just focus on simplicity. I'll just ask them, what is your most important number? And there's only three parts to a business. There's marketing, there's selling, and there's operations. Just, just three. And that's if you're not a startup. And yes, you have customer support, but but finding, getting, and doing. And so once we chunk out those three parts of the business, what are the most important numbers? And, and in my world, we call them VINs, uh, very important numbers. And I like names that have second meanings. I used to work in the automotive industry, VINs, vehicle identification number. So second meeting, also have uh, people in the automotive industry or my clients. But for me, when you start talking to, about VINs, now anyone can say, oh, well, this is an important number. This is an important number. So I kind of get away from the academia of KPIs and just focus on, in your business, what's really critical. Does that, does that help? Makes sense. Um, so then you had mentioned earlier as well uh, the concept of potentiality versus intentionality and maybe not versus, but and. <laughs> uh, and I guess you said maybe there's just one most important number and three kind of parts of the business. So um, I don't know, can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by uh, potentiality versus intentionality? The, and those are two of my favorite words. And, and if any of you work in consulting, in a way, if you're working inside a business, you are by default a consultant. Rich is a consultant to everybody at Lighthouse uh, Foods. So in my world, when I first meet a CEO and then use, sometimes I have a management team or a SLT, senior leadership team, I'm sizing them up on day one. What is the potential for them? And then, I'm, then I will also figure out what are their intentions? So sometimes there is a gap between intentions and potential. And I'm just taking all these mental notes. And then I'm also trying to look at what do I have at my disposal? We've got people, we got resources, we got methods, methods being the IP within the business. So intentionality and potentiality, those are probably the bedrock. And it's something I wish I would have known maybe 20 years ago, because I think I would have been a better, a better, better mentor, a better coach. But once I can understand what the potential, because there are some businesses, the potential is just not there. Um, and then sometimes the intentions are really, really poor. And sometimes you have to step step away because bad intentions will never get to the right potential. So that I know that's very maybe theoretical, very abstract. But for me, when I'm in these meetings and conversations, especially first meetings, second meetings, it's very concrete. And it really helps me to lay out a plan along with the CEO and his or her senior leadership team. So you've had a lot of uh, opportunities to, to talk with CEOs. You might say sweet talk CEOs. I don't know. Um, I think a lot of the folks on this call um, are might like to be in a position to have a conversation with their own CEO. Tell them a little bit about what you know, their contribution to the organization is and maybe, you know, provide that service similar to what you're describing of helping the CEO um, come to the right conclusions about where to drive the business. How, how do you how do you initiate a conversation like that? How do you how would you get? I don't I don't mean like, do you call them on the phone or do you email them? But like if you have the opportunity, what are the kinds of things that you might say to capture the attention of a business leader, you know, from a financial modeling perspective, what kinds of tools do we have? What kinds of things do we know 
that we might be able to catch the attention and, and, and earn the right to have a good conversation with a CEO. Uh, Brad, I love this question. I've been asked this question a lot. Uh, by the way, I do not have a creative bone in my body. So everything I know, I've borrowed it from great people out there. And I want to say 2005, 2006, I came across a guy named Dan Sullivan who created this strategic coach. They're based in Toronto. Uh, I did attend their workshops for three years. And Dan has, well, not Dan, the strategic coach has a book called The DOS Conversation. DOS stands for Dangers, Opportunities, and Strengths. Now, you may think that's SWAT. Well, maybe it is, but I look at the emotional words behind DOS, Dangers, Opportunities, Strengths. So if I get introduced to a CEO, again, I only take on referrals. I will get around to asking them after we chit-chat, talk about Cardinals baseball or sports or NFL football or whatever is going on, family. I'll get around to asking them, what, so what's keeping you up at night? Uh, what is your biggest frustration? And I do like asking questions. I don't like to talk. I don't like to talk about myself. So it's, and plus I love business. So that one question, and sometimes I'll, I'll have a notepad. I'll ask, can I take notes? And I'll usually get maybe five, six, seven fears, frustrations they are trying to eliminate. And I'll just be going through my list. Like I can help, I can help there, I can help there, I can help there. The, the O is opportunities and the emotional word behind that is excitement. Well, I don't ever ask that quite. I know they love their business. Their business is their baby. In fact, it's maybe too much of their baby. So I know what they're excited about. And then the, the, um, the uh, strengths is capabilities, confidence. But I keep going back to that D word, that D word. And by the way, I use this DOS conversation personally. I use it professionally. I have three beautiful kids. I love their adults. They, they have a DOS mindset themselves. So DOS helps me to think about the other people. So I'm always trying to figure out other people's DOS, not for me, but for other people. So that that's that's how I carry on the conversation. And then that just, you never know how those conversations are going to go. And that that it's not a secret. It's just what's keeping you up at night, and then that's now you got a roadmap to start working with. Do you, do you have any? Um, maybe you have some scars on your back from conversations that didn't go as well as you thought that they might have gone. Is there anything you've learned over time that maybe you shouldn't ask about in such a conversation, or shouldn't do, or? Um, I, or, or just kind of guidelines about how to make sure that that kind of conversation goes successfully. Uh, by the way, for full transparency, I knew this question was coming. I don't have a good answer to that. I, I will say this, and, and, uh, and my, my kids are age 29 to mid thirties. So I'll pretend like I'm talking to them. I know when we're young, we get really excited about tools and the techniques. One of my favorite books is The Great Divorce by uh, C.S. Lewis. It's a great management book. It's a great consulting book. Uh, and, and there's this painter who's up in purgatory and he runs into this angel and the angel is talking about, oh, you love your tools. You, you love your canvas. So he's a guy who fell in love with the stuff as opposed to what the stuff was meant to be to make other people happy. And so I know my younger self, I would get so energetic and I, and I do get excited about new stuff. I'm, I'm very I'm overly zealous. 20 years ago, I was overly zealous on everything. But once I just start focusing on the other person, quit, quit, don't talk about yourself. Focus on that other person. And that's the only advice. I don't know if it's the best way to answer a question, but I don't focus on the tools and I don't focus on the output. I'm focused on the outcomes. So I think everyone I've heard, people are focused on outcomes. I don't know if that's going to be an issue for, for those of us in this digital room. So pretend like it's younger people in their 20s that I just gave my answer to. 
Yeah, I mean, for sure, the tools are a means to an end. I mean, we we make some some tools that we think are pretty good, but obviously, the value only comes when the modeler or the the organization decides what's important for them and configures those systems to help them answer the questions that they have. Right? We're just there, you know, to help um, speed that process along. Um, so I don't know, you, 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 I think we talked about the possibility that you might show us how you would use a tool like Quantrix in a conversation like that with a CEO. Um, is that something you, you want to do with yes. us here, Mark? And I think I have shared my screen and, and we, we need to get everyone to say that they're not going to make fun of this. Um, by the way, can you all see my blank Quantrix screen? See ya. You do see it. So again, please don't make fun of this. Rich, Rich is just Rich is probably going to be yawning. Uh, but the very first thing we do, this is what I mean by the world's simplest financial model. Now, Gilbert, if you want to call this the dumbest financial model, that's okay. But this is just at least to start the conversation about planning. We sell some type of an economic unit. Now, now in Rich's case, like, I mean, they sell thousands of SKUs. I used to be a corporate controller in, a, in, in a retail. We had over 200 stores across the Midwest. So I would do things a little bit differently. But just to start that, planning acumen or get that little planning muscle geared up we'll start here so that we can understand kind of what we're we're, we're trying to accomplish then that will lead into what i call uh, hlp in just a minute i clicked on the wrong one so i will do what's called hlp hlp in my world is high level of planning now this is a real company i've switched some of the numbers up and I can't be too specific because there's not very many companies in the U.S. like this. Uh, they are B2B, they're, they're a manufacturer. They're a manufacturer and it's just a big piece of acoustic equipment. They have two similar, these are two different businesses or two S-Corps uh, outside the U.S. Again, two legal entities. They have a third entity this guy is very entrepreneurial. Uh, it's, it's more of a maintenance type business, has nothing to do with the other two. So Brad, when I met with the CEO, I think this meeting number two, we went through this in about 15 minutes and his eyes just started getting bigger. His chief of staff was saying, this is great. And they hadn't even seen the good stuff yet. So we were able to, and by the way, it took me about 15 minutes. I went through their QuickBooks file. Uh, to figure out some of their fixed costs. Uh, I'm pretty close here, I'm pretty close here. So we were able to get to a pretty good idea of what their model looks like conceptually, at least quantified. And then we started looking at potentiality. Well, how many units could they be selling? So again, I know this is completely elementary. It's completely simplistic. Erica, you could do this in five minutes when you first logged into Quantrix. But you have to look at my world, these CEOs, they've never seen this before, uh, they're blown away. Uh, here is another high level. So in the in that last, in, the, in that one, in that other high level plan, there's an entity in the middle and we needed a little bit more complexity, but yet it's still overly simple. So this company has techs that go out in the field and they fix stuff. And again, I can't say what because I'm afraid someone will figure out who, because they serve three big names, big brand names in the United States. So someone might be able to reverse engineer and say, oh, you're working with X company based in a certain state. So I'm being a little bit, um, Try, try to add some security here, not, not share names. But again, how many calls a week? What's the rate per call? How many reps? And by the way, their goal is to get to 22. And 
a lot of these numbers are going to stay really, really close. If we were to see the actuality of these numbers over the next 12 months, except for the 22, I bet we're going to be spot on. And now they've got some new ways to be thinking uh, about their numbers, like calls per week. They don't do NPS. We should be doing some type of NPS after maybe every single phone call. You know, were you happy with that tech that came to visit you? Would you want them to come back? So again, this is allowing us to ask questions that we had not thought about uh, in the past. Again, this all falls under the, the category of the world's simplest model and HLP high level uh, planning. Uh, I don't get it. You get the idea that uh, some of these business owners have never seen just a simple FTE uh, model. Uh, every one of you have this particular setup in your own system. This is a little bit derriere ugly, pardon my French. Uh, it's because I have three different entities that are unique, so I can't categorize these very easily. Uh, but this is this helps this owner to say, okay, I got 23. And then you can see, I, well, I don't see something's not feeding in, but on the text, uh, the text, yeah, the text are in a different model. Uh, the text where we said 15, uh, they would be pulling in here as well, but they're not used to, I don't get it. They're not used to looking at their people and that way if they need to add an FTE, a second FTE, uh, they can see how that adds or subtracts from the, the bottom line. Usually with the types of CEOs I'm, working with when we add people revenue goes up gross profit goes up so i rarely work with people who are worried about cost we rarely talk about costs in any business that i work with uh, the guys i'm working with are very very entrepreneurial and let me go to one more thing here and of course here it likes so you can see it side by side um so that's kind of the high level planning and then one thing i will do uh, before I shut up, when I do high level planning, and again, I, I'm not behind a desk eight, nine, 10 hours a day. I'm in a lot of meetings. I spend a lot of time in meeting time. So it's not like I get to spend all of my time doing model building or model uh, maintenance. So I've got to be in a hurry. So what I will do on the fly like this, this is a this company. They they build big pieces of equipment. They design it. They send it out to I think Japan or somewhere overseas. It gets built. They bring it back. So it's very simple project management. But what I'll do, what I'll do is I'll do just a simple, a really really simple. And I'm going to blow this up if that helps. I I'll build out just a simple what I call a project manager. And then I can say, here's P102, P103. And that's kind of similar to their projects. So when they sell a big piece of equipment, they call it a project. So I will build a quick prototype that will then allow me to you know, feed this little thing. And then as this is updating, another thing I have observed over the years, and again, let me make this a little bit bigger in case you can't see it too well. One thing I have observed with service-based businesses is they don't understand the concept of WIP, work in process. And so what I will do is I'll create these simple WIP schedules. And all of a sudden, this WIP schedule, instead of worrying about this KPI stuff, like what KPIs, if you are a project-based business, just focus on the WIP schedule every single day, every single day. So anyway, th that feeds into this. And so I'll use that prototyping to take into the real model. And then one last thing, and Rich, Rich stole my thunder, but for e-commerce, every business I work with that's usually like e-commerce, uh, I love working with QSRs, quick serve restaurants, casual dining. Uh, it's very, very number centric. I will always, have some type of a URA structure, units, rate, amount. And, and I don't have this prettied up. I did this for demo purposes. Uh, this is actual. Uh, plan could either be plan or it could be last year's numbers. So what, what we're doing, and again, Rich just showed the algebra for this, but what a lot of business owners and even young accountants all notice is they're focusing on the simple variance. But like Rich showed us, 
what's the algebra? So in this fictitious example where, and by the way, I've got this up uh, per tech, uh, per tech, so each tech is like a little mini P&L in this one business, uh, their, their revenue is down $1,100, $1,200 rounded. Well, units, that'd be the tickets that they took care of, was down uh, that many dollars in terms of revenue dollars. But if you look at the price per ticket, uh, it's up 6400 I know this is, we learned this in cost accounting back when we were juniors in college. I get that. But CEOs I, CEOs I work with, they're not used to seeing this. And for now, for the first time, we can start saying, okay, what are we gonna do marketing wise? What are we gonna, how are we gonna work backwards to charts changing the, the marketing? And most of my clients, we end up hiring pricing experts. Pricing to me is like 80% art, 20% science. And we will end up hiring, and two of my clients, we now do dynamic pricing, all because of the stupid, silly little model where we're parsing out units and rate. Okay, how can we start improving the rate, which is one of the hardest things to do uh, in a model. So I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, I had another model teed up. We may be out of time, but let me stop there and ask away. And, and Brad, I hope I've not embarrassed uh, the Quadrix uh, world for showing something so overly elementary. No, I think, I, think uh, I like the I like the, I like the I like idea the, of simple models because they are you're you're not so buried in the details. You can spend your time, as you described earlier, asking that business leader, where do you want to be? Right. Once you set up the kind of basic mechanics, you can ask the question like, okay, your business is ten million dollars now. Um, you'd like to be at a hundred million in three years. You can use that, you know, the simple math to say backwards. Well, what, how many units would we need to get there? Well, how how many factories does it require to make those units per time period? And then how many people do we need to man those factories? And how much is the raw ingredients that we need, you know, to 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 put into those factories to be run by those people to be creating those units, right? And it all just sort of flows out. I think sometimes people get overwhelmed by how do you know how am i going to build a model at in granular detail of my business and you do you, you will need to do that at some point but at the highest level it seems to me that there's a there's a lot to be said for let's build a sketch you know let's try to see like approximately what would be required to do this and and you know we'd like to think that a tool like quantrix helps you do that because in other tools, you, you really can't do anything without putting a formula in every single cell, you know, which is part of the analysis paralysis that I think sometimes some people run into. Uh, I would scream. Some Someone might say, well, couldn't you do that in uh, Excel? And I would scream because even in that other model I had open, there are some things I, I did do that would be very difficult in Excel, and, and I'm not too bad with it, but uh, this makes it a lot easier. I will give you one, I'm, are, how are we doing on time? Are we, uh, I'm not looking at a clock. Looks like we're, are we? we're good, we, a few more minutes and then we'll. What, on one last, the last thing, um, this is a, and again, I gotta be careful because this is one of those, you mentioned 100 million. This is a business that will get to 100 million because they didn't realize that they had this mental, there's this block that think we can't do this. This is a, I'll just say it's uh, vehicle leasing. Uh, they're at a certain number. They're getting to be well known, at least in my part of the, the US. And again, I gotta be careful because I don't wanna give away any names. They now believe they're gonna hit a hundred million. And by the way, this was our first high level model. Uh, we start out with the world's simplest model, but just like you said, Brad, this then started giving way to a little bit more detailed model. You can see all the stuff to the all the all the matrices uh, to the left, and I've kept this open on purpose. So we we do eventually get to complexity, and and everybody is getting it, and so. These guys did zero planning before I came on board. 
So I'm just saying, your I think your question earlier about should everyone, well, your I think your question was should everyone be a, a planner? Well, guess who's doing a lot of planning? It's not me. Uh, they just have this tool at their disposal. So yeah, we started a high level, simplistic, and if you want to call it stupid, that's okay. I'm not going to be offended, but it really clicked. I almost feel like 80% of the value was in those HLP models, whereas this is the remaining 20%. That that, and that may be a that may be unfair, but it feels that way because there's so many ahas when they see these first. So I mean, even this right here, it looks like it looks like but we did this in college. Well, yeah, but a lot of the CEOs under $20 million, they're not doing this very effectively. So sorry uh, if I'm uh, let's move, the way. Yeah, let's move to a couple of questions. Um, Franz asked, do you have any thoughts about how you would break down an ambitious and large project into manageable chunks? I have thoughts. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Can I give you an example? Can, let me. Um, Absolutely. One of the businesses I'm working with right now is so frustrating to me. It's e-commerce. Uh, they're they're a little bit over twenty five million dollars. We spend a boatload of dollars on PPC pay per click, and I think it's ridiculous. We are. I'm working on a model with them right now. And I'm not even sure if I can get the PPC part right because I'm trying to I'm trying to think a little bit too with too much complexity. But you take a marketing team, just let mark build a build a model just for marketing team members where they're focused on getting people in the door and then becoming clients and then also happy sticky clients. I think people who work in a perfect example, this this company right here, we when we you have a there's a line item called IR. I love sports. IR is injured reserve. Well, there's always going to be a few vehicles on injured reserve. They're in the shop. Did you know this business is now a profit center on injured reserve? And when this business gets to be bigger, you're going to have to have someone model this out. We are using SmartSheet for the first time ever to track and manage, but now we need someone just modeling just IR vehicles, vehicles that are not in the fleet, they're inactive because of maintenance or or something's happened. So the answer is yes. I think look at big pieces that impact. One thing I would be, exercise caution on, I'm a big believer in holistic thinking, so there can't be silo thinking. So whatever marketing's doing, it's having an impact downstream. So the further upstream you are, you got to be careful about when you're planning, how does this impact the people, uh, you know, downstream? So I would just say pick two or three areas where there's some big frustration, see if it makes sense if it can be planned out, but also make sure that there's not too much silo thinking because um, you got to understand the impacts and the outcomes to other people who are customers of the people above you. Does that make sense? Uh, I know you didn't ask the question. That's a great question, by the way. It does. It does make sense. Um, I'm curious, Mark, it, can, can you tell us a few stories about maybe organizations who have come to you with a question about um, what their next move should be and, and, and maybe describe a little bit of the, the thought process that you and they went through together and, and perhaps what they ended up doing and, and and how they moved forward? I have a rule. I don't give advice. I want people to ask me the question. I'm a little bit sneaky. And, and by the way, I think my personality is, is I'm not shy, but I'm introverted. And I, I'm not the kind of guy who needs to be heard. So I, I really like playing the role of that left-hand person or that, or not the right hand, but the left-hand person. And if I see something, I'll just keep nudging them and nudging them until they get to where I think they're going to make the right decision. There's a company in the far right here. Um, I don't see them. I don't. Oh, it's on this page right here. 
there's a specialty cabinet maker. Now you may be thinking cabinet maker, that's got to be a mom and pop. Well, actually they're not. Uh, they have they have businesses or clients all around the United States. And the first thing I did was let me see every project you've completed in the last 60 months. And all I did was I just did a little scatter plot and they had a few million dollar projects. There's even one that was like $3 million at, a, at an airport. Uh, Joplin, Missouri, you know where that is, Lindsay. Uh, there was a tornado there a few years ago, wiped out some hospital schools. They had a $3 million project. So I just asked a stupid question. Are these fun to work with? And the answer was no. Well, they had a, these clusters, $80,000, 75000 And it turned out that they had a big client, uh, publicly traded, uh, building these dialysis clinics around the U.S., and they were the sole, they were the prime contractor for the cabinets. And so we went into what's called the DTC model, direct to consumer, and we quit going through contractors. And all that was me is I just asked a couple of stupid questions and pointed some things out. And then we actually did a stupid high level model to show we can actually do pretty good if we just concentrate on these D DTC model where you're doing these 80, 90, $100,000 contracts. So we started saying no to the million, two million, because they take so long to do, take so long so long to get the, the, the billings out. Uh, and I will say one more if we have time. So I, I love the PT. A lot of these industries, I've never even seen them before. So I think that's another secret is you, you don't have any of these preconceived ideas about what should be right. Um, right now, I'm working in the auto dealership world, and it's like those guys are idiots in their reporting. And you need to ask me that sometime in the future. We need to bring Quantrix to Ford and GM dealerships. They need it. But Physical Therapy Group uh, up outside of Chicago, they knew they didn't know any of this stuff. So we started modeling out their business. Not only did we model it out, we did. I'm a big believer in, in financial transparency. So it got to be at the end of about one year, every person down to the receptionist getting profit sharing. And that's a case where all we did was we took, oh, by the way, this is one of the most powerful management tools ever designed, uh, post-it notes. So we, we would just post it on the processes. You know, when a patient comes in, when they go out, we would follow the digital paper uh, as we would get paid until we got paid back. So we modeled that stuff out, created some really cool models. And our, yes, is our top line higher? Yes. Uh, cash flow higher? Yes. By the way, my client just got back uh, from two weeks uh, down somewhere in Mexico where they, I mean, he wouldn't have been able to do that two years ago. So I'm not really being the guy that says you need to do this. I'm really good at asking stupid questions. That's my God-given talent. I can ask questions where I think, I wonder if they thought about this. So that's so we're getting results because they really haven't thought through some of these questions that can then be quantified in a simple planning uh, tool. And again, sorry if I rambled. That's great. That's Let great. me see if we've got any questions coming in. Um, so Franz again asked, do you have, do, do you manage networking capital? Is that a, is that a, a, a metric or a driver that you look, that you look at or, or bring to, to the front with some of your customers? The, there's a word I want to say, there's two words. The second word is yes. And the first word is, uh, starts with an H, but I won't say that. But, heck yes. Uh, especially e-commerce, uh, e-commerce. Uh, I will say this on, on e-commerce. Yeah, I can tell you down to the day, I, a lot of my clients in e-commerce were anywhere from uh, zero cash conversion days. By the way, I use the term cash purgatory. Um, you're in a deeper level of purgatory with inventory. It just takes longer for that inventory. So the answer is yes. And by the way, my favorite way of managing and even though I, I like the cash conversion days, even though I like days sales and, and, and receivables and all that, you know the simplest way to manage and improve your inventory turns? Every week, if not daily, every week, 
just run an inventory aging report. And then if you have a, a Power BI or a Tableau, and you can do it in, in Quadrix, but start asking the questions, why do we have this big bucket of inventory that's stuck out here in 100 plus days? So to me, the answer is yes. And, and I have written about um, networking capital extensively. Uh, what, when I do P&Ls, you'll almost always see in my inventory-based businesses, uh, you'll see networking capital is a percentage of either gross profit or, or revenue. I don't put it on page. It's right at the very bottom of my of my P and L. So the answer is yes. But I kind of got into a prescriptive on make sure you're looking at those aging, especially on inventory. Uh, ERP systems stink. At sometimes uh, I, I work a lot with the division. Uh, it's hard to get a good aging report. You almost have to kind of uh, tinker with the data to get it just right, set up just right. But the answer is yes. Uh, it you. That's critical, and you will make your you will make your salary back uh, with with uh, networking capital management. AR is a little bit boring because I am harsh. Um, when when my clients clients are one day past due, they get a phone call. Now I'm talking where we have maybe 100, 200 clients, customers. They get a phone call. No emails. That 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 is a rule, and that way once they get a phone call, they're le less likely. So we're working on the things ahead of time to keep people from paying late. And if they're going to eventually pay late, let's just change your terms to an extra 10. But guess what? Then they're going to cheat some more. So I, I have my ways of dealing with, with, with AR past dues. It's just they get a phone call the next day, they're, they're late because our relationships are based on trust. So they just disrespected you by paying late. So my focus more on, on inventory. AP, I always pay based on terms. My rule with AP is try to pay three or four days early, and that's come back to help me. Uh, during COVID, uh, when we needed a grace from some of our vendors, because we pay in advance with a lot of our vendors, we got lots of lots of take your time, take your time. So I like to pay early, but on inventory, work that puppy to death. Long answer, sorry. Great. Uh, so let's see if we have if anyone's got a, a a last question. I think we could scooch one one in before the next session. Um, type that into the chat. And if not, we will thank you, Mark, for your joining us here today. It was fantastic to have a conversation with you and. I um, hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you.